Hey girls, what's that? Obviously it's wood. No, it's not. It's not? No, it's a boat. Wow! Magic. <laughs> Welcome to the build of our GT27 houseboat. The GT27 is 27 and a half feet long by eight and a half feet wide. The design is by Jacques Merton, who describes her as a roomy trailerable river cruiser. When finished, she will have modest accommodations for two large beds at opposite ends of the cabin, with room for a small kitchenette and bathroom in between. We plan to use her for overnight to five day trips on lakes, rivers, and portions of the Intracoastal Waterway. We will also use her on the trailer as a travel trailer for visits to campgrounds and RV parks. We began the build in late July 2018 and have been documenting the major steps as we go along. Okay, this is our cut list. And so this shows where each of the pieces comes out of the panels and what size panels. So all of our bottom panels are gonna come out of half inch and all of our side panels are gonna come out of three eighths. Building a boat of this size presents some significant logistical challenges. As a stitch and glue design, nearly the entire structure is built from large plywood panels. This eliminates the framing used in more traditional designs, substantially reducing weight. The panels are BS 1088 marine grade plywood, a light, strong, rot resistant plywood made with waterproof glues. To protect the panels from dirt and debris, I laid down sheets of chipboard to create a work surface, which worked out well. To transfer the shape of the panels from the plans to the plywood, we measured at predetermined coordinates. Then we drove nails at each of the points and used a flexible batten pressed firmly against the nails to establish the desired curve. From there, it's just a matter of cutting along the lines. To get more accurate cuts, I prefer to cut about 1 16th of an inch outside of the line. Then I use a block plane to trim down to the line for a more exact shape. While lofting and cutting out the hull panels, there were other preparations to be made. We tracked down a heavy-duty aluminum trailer, which would eventually carry the finished boat, but which could be used in the interim to fetch the long lengths of lumber we would need during the build. We also rented a Kubata to widen and level the yard beside our house. Then we extended the privacy fence forward and installed a large 12-foot wide gate to create adequate space for building and later storing the boat. Next, it was time to build the strong back or building cradle, which will support the frames that allow us to join the hull panels together in proper shape.
To get the desired thickness for the bow and stern transoms, multiple half-inch thick panels must be glued together. The bow transom is laminated from two panels and the stern transom is laminated from four. In each case, I measured and cut out the first panel to determine the shape. Then I propped it up on blocks so I could trace around it using a flush cut bit on my router to cut the remaining panels. This is much faster and results in an exact copy. To glue the panels together, first we coat each face with raw epoxy for a good soak-in bond. Then we use epoxy thickened with fume silica to create a creamy consistency and spread it evenly over the panels. We line up the panels, press them flat on a level surface, and add weight to apply pressure until the epoxy cures. Next it was time to join the hull panels to make them full length. Sheets of chipboard across the strong back provide the large level table surface needed for this job. Later, the same sheets of chipboard will be used to make the forms that align the hull into shape. Each joint gets a 6 inch wide strip of 9 ounce biaxial fiberglass tape on both sides. After aligning the panels on the table to determine where the joints would fall, I nailed the aftmost panel to the table surface with two finishing nails to prevent it from sliding or twisting out of place. Then we positioned a strip of builder's plastic under each joint. This allowed us to lay down a strip of tape and saturate it with epoxy without bonding it to the table. When we reached the far end, we applied pressure along the length of the panels and used two more finishing nails to prevent the seams from spreading apart. Next, we forced thickened epoxy into each seam to fill any voids and applied another strip of tape over the top of the seam. Then we covered each seam with another strip of builder's plastic and used a board with weights to press the seams flat until cured. We repeated this process to join each of the four long panels that will make up the sides and bottom of the 27 foot long hull. The frames are cross sections of the hull shape spaced at known intervals to create a three dimensional mold over which the panels are laid and joined. This step is exciting because it's the first good glimpse of the approximate size and shape of the finished hull. With all of the frames aligned, leveled, and plumbed, we carefully lifted the long hull panels up onto the mold. Despite their weight and noodle-like flexibility, the bottom panels go fairly easily. Installing the side panels is more challenging because the weight has to be supported while aligning the edges and using fasteners to hang it in place. After many hours of careful alignment, we used a block plane and a router with a flush cut bit to trim all of the edges flush.
fiberglass tape that was used to join the hull panels to full length was plenty strong to hold the panels together, but despite our efforts to press it flat while curing, it showed noticeable creases and voids. We spent a lot of time sanding the tape flat, but eventually decided the splices needed to be removed entirely, which we found easiest to do with a power planer. Next, we filled the gaps along all seams with thickened epoxy. Once cured, we sanded the filler and edges to ensure a smooth transition and generously rounded edges. Then we covered each seam with three staggered layers of 9 ounce by axial fiberglass tape, overlapping the tape at the corners for added strength. After all seams were taped and cured, we again used a sander and power planer to remove the remainder of the original panel splices. With the seams taped, and the panel joins still supported on the other side by another tape splice, everything held together fine. We sanded the edges of the tape to taper and smooth the transition with the rest of the hull, as well as to facilitate a bond with the bottom layers of fiberglass. For durability, we chose to cover the hull with three layers of 12 ounce by axial fiberglass with a 45-45 weave. Each layer is formed from three strips of 50 inch wide cloth, overlapped along the edges by six to eight inches to ensure a good bond and increase stiffness. Around this time, the weather in Georgia turned unseasonably cold and unusually wet. To protect the hull from moisture and allow the fiberglass to cure properly, we erected a 12 foot wide by 32 foot long shelter around the hull. Sealed up tight with tarps and heavy duty plastic, we found we could heat the interior 30 degrees warmer than the outside temperature using three tank mounted propane heaters. This allowed us to work through the wet and cold without further delays. With so many overlapping layers, there is a lot of sanding and fairing work involved to restore the surfaces to the desired flatness and smoothness. To create a fairing compound, we mixed epoxy with fumed silica and phenolic microbloons. The latter additive makes for an airier consistency that is easier to sand, and also gives it a dark color that makes it much easier to see high and low spots in the fiberglass. Each surface received three separate passes with fairing compound. We allowed each pass to cure and re-sanded the entire surface in between. This is slow, tedious, exhausting work, but it is critical in order to eliminate any voids or flaws in the fiberglass and to get a good painted finish. After weeks of fairing and sanding, it was time to apply the final coatings to the hull. 
for the bottom we decided on a mixture of epoxy thickened with graphite. Graphite is used as an industrial lubricant, and the resulting hard but slippery surface is said to provide much better abrasion resistance than most commercially available bottom paints. Epoxy degrades under exposure to UV, so we will only use this mixture on the bottom which will not receive direct sunlight either on the trailer or in the water. Each bottom coat required a total of 42 ounces of epoxy mixed with 14 ounces of graphite by volume, which we mixed in four separate batches to prevent the resin from kicking and becoming tacky before we could roll it on. To make it easier to apply, we preheated each batch of resin to 90 degrees to improve its flow and mixed in graphite gradually using a sifter to avoid clumps. This resulted in a consistency very similar to latex paint which rolled on easily and resulted in a surprisingly smooth finish. We applied three consecutive coats in this fashion, letting each coat cure for approximately four hours before the next coat. This avoids any need for sanding, as it is well within the cure window to ensure a strong chemical bond with the previous layer. This is another exciting step in the boat building process, as the coating really reveals the fruits of all of our hard work to sand the surfaces flat. Next, we cut and installed the rub rails that run along the upper edges of the hull sides. Each rail is laminated together from three layers of wooden strips, resulting in a rail that is one and a half inches tall, three quarters inch thick, and over 27 feet long. When bonded to the hull sides, the rails increase stiffness, encourage a fair curve from bow to stern, and provide a landing surface to attach the deck. With the rub rails installed and masked off, it was time to paint the rest of the hull. First, we applied four coats of EMC Series 45 surfacing primer. Each coat required approximately 48 ounces of the mixed primer. We applied each coat using a quarter inch nap mohair roller spacing the coats about three hours apart to ensure a good chemical bond without need for sanding. After letting the primer cure for a week, we sanded the surface flat using 220 grit and a random orbital sander. Then it was time to apply paint. EMC Quantum 99 paint is unbelievably expensive, but it goes on like magic, and at least in the Whaler blue color we chose, covers any discolorations in the underlying surface with ease on the first coat. We rolled it on using EMC's recommended 6.5 inch foam cigar rollers, which are perfect for the job. The paint flows on so well, we found it unnecessary to tip with a brush. Each coat required approximately 27 ounces of the mixed paint. We applied three coats in all, waiting for the previous coat to dry to the touch before applying the next. With the shelter heated to 78 degrees and a relative humidity of 60%, it took about three to four hours between coats. While allowing the paint to cure for a week, we upgraded the trailer, installing taller bunk brackets and replacing the original rotting bunks with new ones.
bunks, we sanded, liquid nailed, and screwed together two 12 foot long 2x10 pressure treated pine boards to make each bunk. Together with the taller galvanized brackets, this raised the hull high enough to clear the fenders of the trailer. It was time for the single greatest logistical challenge of the entire project, the Big Flip. Estimating that the hull weighed somewhere between 1,000 and 1,500 pounds, we developed our solution around that figure. There are many ways to flip a boat, but few that seem safe, manageable, and cost-effective for a hull this size. Eventually, we settled on flipping it rotisserie style. This entailed building a pair of 8-foot-high towers at each end of the hull and rigging them with a pair of 1,000-pound capacity chain hoists. Once the towers were in place and adequately braced, we drilled three quarter inch holes in the middle of the bow and stern transoms and installed a three quarter inch diameter rod of all thread backed with large washers and additional blocks of wood. After detaching most of the forms from under the boat, we wrapped a heavy duty lifting strap under the all thread rod at each end and began to raise the hull using the chain hoists. Around 90 degrees, the hull was ready to come around and high enough to clear the ground, but it was pinched against the last piece of our building cradle. We decided the safest solution was to stand clear to either side of the cradle and lift it into the hull. This worked out well, as the weight of the remaining cradle frame slowed the rotation of the hull to a manageable speed. We backed the trailer underneath and lowered the hull down onto the bunks, which we had already adjusted and planed to match the shallow V of the hull bottom for a perfect fit. Amazingly, after many long months of hard work, our hull was finally upright. 